Welcome to the first of a three-part series of professional learning workshops hosted by United Cerebral Palsy in collaboration with the UCP National Research Committee, Gillette Children's Specialty Healthcare, UCP of Minnesota, and UCP of Central Arizona. Today's UCP professional learning series topic is the critical role of gait analysis in the care of individuals with cerebral palsy. Our speaker is an associate medical director at Gillette Children's Specialty Healthcare and pediatric orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Tom Novacek. In that capacity, he has worked extensively to develop the James R. Gage Center for Gait and Motion Analysis. He specializes in treating cerebral palsy and complex hip conditions in children and adults. Dr. Novacek is first vice president of the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine, AACPDM, and a professor of orthopedics at the University of Minnesota. He's the author of many academic journal articles and several books, including Improving Quality of Life for Individuals with Cerebral Palsy Through Treatment of Gait Impairment, International Cerebral Palsy Function and Mobility Symposium Clinics in Developmental Medicine, which he co-authored with Gillette clinical scientist Michael Schwartz, Ph.D. Dr. Novacek is actively involved in cerebral palsy research. In today's session, he will discuss gait and motion analysis, why it is used, and how care decisions are made related to the findings. Please welcome Dr. Tom Novacek. Hi. My name is Dr. Tom Novacek. I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon at Gillette Children's Specialty Healthcare. Uh, I'm really pleased to be able to represent uh, Gillette and the James R. Gage Center for Gait and Motion Analysis today to talk about the role of gait analysis and how critical it is in the care of, children, of individuals with cerebral palsy. Gillette was established in 1897 by Dr. Gillette. Uh, it was first a state hospital, uh, subsequent to that a nonprofit private hospital. Uh, located in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, and that is our skyline. Cerebral palsy gait is really complex. Uh, I'm going to start with some case examples just to get us uh, uh, started on the right foot. We're going to talk about what gait analysis is uh, and what CP is and how it affects gait, what we've learned not to do, what we are currently doing for modern day treatment options, and then follow up again with those same cases as illustrations to show you the results. I will be talking about different GMFCS levels. So hopefully all of you are familiar with these things. Uh, GMFCS 1 for cerebral palsy, children able to get around on uh, all surfaces and including running, going up and down stairs, not needing a railing. GMFCS 2 doing well on level surfaces but struggling a little bit on different surfaces, maybe needing a hand railing to go up the stairs. GMFCS3 using assisted devices for ambulation, but allowed to use a wheelchair for longer distance community mobility. GMFCS4 for exercise mobility mainly, not very much functional ambulation. And GMFCS5 uh, using a wheelchair for almost all mobility. The focus of this talk will be on GMFCS levels one, two, and three. This is our first case example. A boy with cerebral palsy, really high functioning, but really significant high muscle tone. We'll be coming back to him later. Our second case is also a very high functioning patient, GMFCS level one, but hemiplegic, uh, but a severe type four hemiplegic, and we'll come back to that as well later. And the final case is a more complicated case, an older individual, adolescent, who's been going downhill uh, and is now functioning at GMFCS level three. And obviously you can see this is a patient in severe crouch. So we'll be coming back to those at the end of the talk. So now we're gonna go into the talk about what is gait and gait analysis. And maybe we should have the number for Gillette there instead of 800-555-1212. If we're gonna talk about gait, we need to understand the gait cycle. So one stride is one gait cycle. It's divided into periods of stance and swing. Those periods have important uh, tasks associated with them that are different. And in order to understand how the muscles and the bones and the skeleton work at these different uh, points in time, we also subdivide further into these subphases. So we have the initial contact loading response, mid stance, terminal stance, and then in, in uh, uh, pre-swing. And then in swing, we've got initial, mid, and terminal swing. So hopefully these terms are familiar to you. 
we put the gate cycle on a, on a uh, x-axis. We think about that person walking through the gate cycle. Uh, the gate cycle starts and ends at initial contact when the foot first strikes the ground. There's a point, off, a point where the toe uh, comes off the ground, and that separates stance phase from swing phase. And with normal gait, that is right around 60% point of the gate cycle. Because it's further or later than the 50% point, there are periods of double support at the beginning and end of stance. And those are called loading response and pre-swing. And then in between, you've got these periods of single support, that's mid-stance and terminal stance. And then again, the three periods during swing phase, initial, mid, and terminal swing. We next talk about the priorities of normal gait, and mainly these come from Jackie Perry. So the first is stability and stance. The second, clearance and swing. The third is prepositioning of the foot for initial contact, that proper heel strike position without inversion or eversion. And adequate step length. And finally, energy conservation. So if you're thinking about someone's uh, gait, you can think about how are they doing in terms of these priorities of normal gait. Walking is the way that most of us get from one place to another. Uh, it's really a main way that we transport our head and our hands from one place to another. We don't think about it if you have a normal gait. Uh, it's reciprocal, it's symmetric, it's reproducible and efficient. Uh, so it's just something that unless you really spend time thinking about it, you may not have thought about it in detail. And it is dynamic, and that's really the crux of why we need a gait analysis laboratory, because you can't measure gait on an x-ray or an MRI scan or even by physical examination. You need those things, but you can't do uh, a good job with gait without having a gait analysis laboratory because of the dynamic nature of what you're treating. So when we have a patient go to our gait lab, they get a split screen video. It's a very high quality, high resolution digital camera. We have a custom viewer that we use for all of our reviews within our Gillette system. And that video is an example of that. We do collect plantar pressures. So if you're in Minnesota, you like to watch the weather map because the radar maps tell us what's gonna happen in the next few hours. And uh, we're all glued to our television sets because our weather is all over the board. And, and uh, so these same types of uh, impressions come from the plantar pressures and can be very helpful when we're talking to patients and families about what's going on with their feet. There's a very detailed, extensive physical examination that takes upwards of 45 to 50 minutes done by a highly trained physical therapist looking at range of motion, alignment, strength, selectivity, spasticity, and uh, uh, other tone patterns as well as a detailed physical examination. And this uh, format is uh, fairly standard across most gait, gait analysis laboratories. The key part of gait analysis is measuring the body's motion. And we do that by applying these reflective markers. So here, Sue is putting the markers on a patient's uh, lower extremities. And those markers are picked up in the motion capture system by a set of cameras. And every now and then some shenanigans goes on in the gait lab and uh, we hear about it, uh, but we don't really want to know what's going on down there all the time. But this is a picture of what our gate lab looks like. Uh, so you can see around the top of the room, there's a set of cameras. So the patient does walk down that walkway across that plantar pressure mat and also across the force plates. Uh, and the video is uh, capturing the motion of those uh, uh, markers on the person's uh, uh, body. So in this animation, we've got a number of cameras there around the periphery of the room. They're looking in at these markers, and uh, uh, you can see the markers there in the middle on the person's body. And uh, the cameras are emitting light and receiving light from those markers. So if any two cameras see any marker at any one point in time, the system is calibrated so it knows exactly where that marker is in space. And if you have three of those markers on a body segment, you can track that body segment as it moves through that space. So what we see is that boy standing here with the markers in place. What the camera system sees is this. And then it creates a model to be able to measure the motions of those different sets of markers relative to one another. And again, we see the boy, the camera system sees the skeletal animation. So we measure the markers, 
We define the body segments with markers, with, ana with anatomy, we define the joints and collect the, calculate the motions and we output the data on a set of graphs like this. So this is three-dimensional gait analysis. So that set of top graphs is for the pelvis, the second is the hip, the third is the knee, and the bottom is the foot and ankle. And the left column is the coronal plane, the center column, the sagittal plane, and the right column, the transverse plane. So three-dimensional gait analysis. And when we output this, each one of these graphs is one gait cycle. So again, we've got initial contact through stance phase, toe off, swing phase, next initial contact. And for the normative data, it's always in the gray bands. And then we have the patient's right side in the green and the left side in the red, so we can look at the two sides at the same time. So that's the data that we look at in, in terms of understanding kinematics and motion analysis. Then we also, for independently ambulatory individuals, GMFCS 1 and 2, we measure their force plate data. So the force plates are in the floor. They're meant to be masked so people aren't targeting for them. Uh, these are basically fancy bathroom scales, uh, but it, they measure not only the magnitude of the force, but also the direction in all three directions. And then the computer system does some fancy legwork with the uh, inverse dynamics, so it does all of these calculations for us, and we get forces and moments uh, from that data. And now we add to the motion data the measured forces, and we calculate the moments and powers, and we get a set of graphs that now looks like this. So the top set of graphs in the sagittal plane are the hip, knee, and ankle. That's the same data that we looked at on the last set of graphs. And this, new, this uh, second row is now the joint moment. So that would be the stress across the joint, again, for the hip, knee, and ankle. And finally, the power. So if you're wondering where your patient is generating power, you'd look at the bottom set of graphs and uh, look at that data. So again, for the hip, knee, and ankle. So that's kinetics. We also measure EMG. Almost all of our patients are only having uh, surface EMG acquired, but we can do fine wire EMG for various muscles. But for gait analysis, for gait purposes, most of the data that we need can be uh, gathered with surface electrodes. And with that, then our patients are pretty happy to come back and see us again because we haven't put a fine wire in while they were, while they were there. And we output that data again on uh, all of these graphs. So these, these are all the types of graphs that are then presented to our clinicians and, uh, to do the interpretation. We also measure energy expenditure. So this is a child walking around the periphery of the gate lab with, an with a mask on, and then there's an oximeter and an oxygen supply, and we're measuring the per the, her gate efficiency. And uh, we certainly see with many of our uh, patients with abnormal gate patterns and, and or spasticity a very high energy consumption, and we're able to measure that. And we output that data like this. So if we have a patient initially uh, with, a, with a dot here, which means a very high energy energy expenditure at this walking speed. If they come back the second time and, and something has happened in the interim uh, and they're doing better, their oxygen consumption can go down and get down towards this normative range here. Uh, so a person with normal gait walking speed and a normal gait pattern uh, would have an energy expenditure uh, in, in that area. This whole process takes about two and a half hours. So you can see the different time allotments there. You can see that a good portion of that time is actually spent on the physical examination and getting a very detailed uh, part. Uh, our staff is very efficient at doing this. They're really good at it um, and can get these kids in and out uh, quite quickly. Once we have the data acquired, then we need to do a gait interpretation session. So that's where the physical therapist who acquired the data sits down with uh, one of the interpreting physicians, me for example, or one of my colleagues, uh, to do an interpretation. Uh, generally the engineer is there as well, so we have uh, a multidisciplinary team to be able to look at that uh, data and uh, try to have an interpretation. So we're trying to create a problem list from all of that data. And then uh, from that problem list, we can have a conversation about what the different treatment options would be. And, uh, and that would be what I'd present to the family when we go up to the outpatient clinic then to discuss it with the patient and family to, to see what uh, might be um, the most appro appropriate decisions and do that in a shared decision-making fashion.
We do a lot of work at our gate lab to try to be sure that we are gathering really high quality, reliable data that's useful to the clinicians. So one of the examples that I want to give to you here is about something called a functional model. So there's a standard gait model that's really dependent on how well the therapist applies the marker. So if you have somebody who's inexperienced and they don't really know how to apply the markers, with the standard model you will get poor data, just like you might get poor data if you have uh, somebody who's not very familiar with physical examination uh, as compared to someone who's more experienced. But the functional model bypasses all of that. So uh, instead of us telling the computer system where the joint centers are, we ask the computer system to tell us where the joint centers are. And the uh, advantage of that and what uh, the therapist is doing here at the ankle is, is tracing the medial and the lateral malleolus with this instrumented wand. And I think it's hard to see here in the video, but this wand has a marker here and a marker here. So it places a virtual marker over the medial and lateral malleolus. And that allows us to measure the uh, bimalleolar axis angle. So the data that we can output then allows us to actually measure tibial torsion dynamically during gait analysis. So how do we do that? We look at when the knee is most extended, and then we look at a knee rotation graph to see how the patient's data uh, is related to that in the transverse plane. So that would take that bimalleolar axis angle relative to the functional knee joint axis and output that as a dynamic measure of tibial torsion. And if you're experienced in the field, uh, you know that there's a lot of variability in tibial torsion measurements from one examiner to another, uh, and even within examiners. So our inter and intra observer uh, error rates for tibial torsion measurements are significant, and this has really helped us a lot with uh, uh, assessing tibial torsion. So how do we do that? If I have a patient like this whose right side shows that their tibia is externally malaligned relative to the normal, we can actually, if we feel that that's good quality data, we can measure the amount of offset between what the normal is and what the patient's data is. And then when we go to surgery to do a tibial derotational osteotomy, uh, we can actually use that data directly to decide how much to derotate. So, uh, sorry, this is a surgical video. Hopefully you're okay with that. Uh, but this patient is on their stomach. So the knee is down and the foot is up. And this is the anterior distal tibia, so right above the ankle, you can see the foot there. So I've drilled two pins into the bone, one above and one below where the ultimate osteotomy is going to be. And I've measured the angular offset in the transverse plane between those two pins. So we use the goniometer. So we've got those two pins in, and that's the plate sitting there that we're going to use. And there's the goniometer again. So we measure the transverse plane offset. So we put them in at a converging angle. We cut the bone and then derotate until the two pins are parallel. So we'll see that we're gonna put those pins back in. We've got the plate in place, and we derotate the bone until those two pins are parallel, and then we put our implants in. And that's my, our way to be able to take a patient to the operating room with data from the gate lab telling us how much to derotate the tibia, and we can translate that and actually do that uh, correction very accurately in the operating room. We started to supplement that with EOS imaging. So if you're familiar with this or not, I'm not sure. It's a pretty new technology. We've only had it at our, uh, at our hospital for the last four years. Uh, so it's a uh, very low dose, biplanar, simultaneous x-rays. So there's an x-ray gantry that moves up and down, takes these images, and you can do it for the spine and you can do it for the lower extremities. In this case, we're talking about gait. So this patient has had distal femoral derotational osteotomies. Those are the plates that you see in. And here we're measuring their, their three-dimensional alignment uh, it, it, with the EO system. So those are the x-rays, the AP and lateral view. The, uh, those th two views are then also digitized so that the x-ray tech is do does a digitization to uh, conform the patient's skeleton to the model of the system. And with that then, you can get three-dimensional models of the skeletal structure. And you can get the, all three planes. And then when we output the data, we get a lot of uh, parameters uh, that are measured here, and I'm going to focus here on these last ones. So with this system, we get a measurement of femoral torsion and tibial torsion without the high radiation dosage of a CT scan or the expense of a CT scan or an MRI scan. So this technology is not only low-dose radiation, but it's no more expensive uh, uh, than a standard uh, X-ray.
So we're starting to put that together with gait analysis information to uh, try to do even a, even a better job. So what does it do for us? We see a patient with a complex movement. We create these skeletal animations and models. We put all of this on these gait graphs, and then we do that interpretation. And you know, there's a lot of uh, learning that comes from a knowledge of normal and pathological gait. So we, you know, a couple of things to mention here are how our muscles move and uh, or how our muscles help us. So. I will say that when I was in training, I thought about muscles as propellers. You know, they, they were used to create force to propel us from one place to the next. I didn't really think about the fact that muscles have a very important role to play for stabilization of body and main, maintenance of posture. Uh, so we need to remember that both of those are critically important and that a muscle that doesn't have a good lever arm to work on, a properly aligned bone and skeletal structure, also can't be very effective. So you could have a strong muscle that could create a good force, but not a good system that creates a good joint moment, which is what you need for gait. We know that gravity is co constant, and in order for us to walk upright, we have to have muscles that do that for us. So we have a list of anti-gravity muscles. Here's the list. And, uh, and you know, if these muscles are working well and they're working on a well-aligned skeletal system, everything is fine and you would be considered to have a normal gait pattern. And unfortunately, that's what our patients uh, don't have. So they can have problems with strength deficits and bony malalignments that affect their gait. And here's an example, something called the plantar flexion knee extension couple. So I'll try to describe this. So Newton said that for each, uh, for each object pushing against uh, another object, there's an equal and opposite force. So we measure with the force plate, uh, and we interpolate from that what that equal and opposite force would be. And relative to the knee joint center, if you're in an upright stance, this ankle plantar flexion moment is, is actually create, is controlling the alignment of the um, ground reaction force so that it's anterior to the knee joint center. And in that sense, your ankle plantar flexors, by controlling your tibial position, are helping to keep your knee in extension. And that's a very efficient mechanism for being able to do this. So, but that's in normal gait. So in abnormal pathological gait, you can have too much of an ankle moment or too little. So uh, in the case of too little, you can have a weak ankle plantar flexor or a poorly aligned foot. And in the case of uh, an abbreviated second rocker, you can have an overactive ankle plantar flexor either from contracture or spasticity and have a restricted second rocker. So here's an animation that can help us to understand this a little bit better. So uh, we don't do these animations on a regular, on a regular basis, uh, but they could be done uh, for individual patients. So you can cr input the data for my gait get analysis laboratory and have an animation walk. And then if you either increase or decrease the electrical activity of the muscle, you can change what happens. So here in this case, we're going to increase the activity of the ankle plantar flexors, and you'll see what happens. The heel goes up, as you might imagine, but the knee also extends. So the ankle plantar flexors, when they're activated more than normal, they not only elevate the heel, but they also extend the knee. In the opposite situation where we decrease the activation of the ankle plantar flexors, see what happens with the tibia and the knee in this case. And that's what happens when you lose second rocker restraint and the tibia falls forward and goes into crouch. So that's an inadequate plantar flexion knee extension couple. So you have, you have this knowledge that you acquire from normal and pathological gait to help you understand the biomechanics. So really gait analysis is, is about understanding the biomechanics for your individual patient and that allows you to do individualized diagnosis and treatment planning. Then you can have them come back after a significant intervention, assess the outcome, and by knowing your outcomes from each patient as they come back and pooling those patients and seeing how a group of patients are doing, you can then refine your understanding of biomechanics for the next set of patients who come along. So that's really how, how gait analysis fits in clinically. So let's step away from gait and gait analysis and talk about what is cerebral palsy and how it affects gait. So as experienced practitioners, you uh, understand the definition of cerebral palsy, that it's a motor disability uh, that causes problems with movement and posture. It is non-progressive. Uh, it's present at a very early point in a child's uh, lifetime. And uh, there can be a variety of different etiologies, but ultimately the basic basis is that there's abnormal development of the central nervous system. It's quite common. 
there are lots of causes. So we've got, and these different causes can cause different movement patterns and different types of involvement in different parts of the body. Uh, so it, these, uh, if you classify your cerebral palsy based on etiology, you'd be looking at the classification system along these lines. Other classifications are dependent upon what part of the body is involved. So if it's all four extremities, that's quadriplegia. If it's uh, lower extremities more than arms, that's diplegia. One side of the body, hemiplegia, and double hemiplegia, people will talk about as well. If you talk about the different types of tone, there's yet a different classification system. So we have spasticity that uh, is caused by an injury to the cortical spinal tracts. We have dystonia and athetosis caused by basal ganglia injuries and then mixed problems where there's problems with both parts of the brain uh, mentioned above. And then if you talk about classification based on function, then we get yet another classification system, the GMFCS that we've already talked about. So there are lots of different ways to classify our cerebral palsy spectrum uh, of uh, involvement. And this is a very busy slide, but it's meant to be busy to show you how complex, and uh, we all know that uh, control of movement uh, and locomotion is a very complex process that involves numerous parts of the, the brain and the uh, segmental spinal reflexes uh, and uh, throughout the entire uh, upper and lower uh, uh, motor neurons. In order to make the diagnosis of cerebral palsy, these generally made by delays in the attainment of normal motor milestones. So that comes from the developmental history and observations during the physical examination. Uh, it allows you to formulate a motor age. Uh, there are other markers of neuromaturation, the primitive reflexes and postural reactions. Primitive reflexes typically disappear with normal growth and development quite early on. And then po postural reactions develop in their place and appear sequentially uh, also in the first year of life. And uh, most of the time, the diagnosis is made by a neurologist, and they're very highly trained, of course, in doing a good neurological exam. But ultimately, the neurological injury manifests itself in our patients as central nervous system problems, and th these would be the primary problems, the loss of selective motor control, spasticity, balance, weakness problems. Uh, that leads to difficulty with uh, normal activities at normal ages, so uh, that then can lead to secondary problems of muscle contractions, contractures, abnormal skeletal forces result from both of these things, and then in the end you end up with bony deformity. So that's kind of the cascade of events that happens with our cerebral palsy patients, and if we understand that cascade, we can then understand that there are different types of problems that occur with our cerebral palsy patients. So you can divide them into the primary, those things that are directly from the central nervous system injury, again, the balance, strength, weakness, spasticity problems, motor control issues. The secondary, so these would be the contractures and uh, bony deformities, and patients who are able to cope and respond to those things will develop tertiary or coping responses. And the gait analysis uh, laboratory can help us differentiate between all three of these areas. Uh, because ultimately, these, these three areas have different treatments, right? If it's spasticity, you might be treating a primary problem, and if it's a contracture or bony deformity, it would be an orthopedic problem. And we need to recognize when a patient is coping, you know, maybe they're circumducting or they're vaulting, uh, and those are normal coping responses. And if we didn't recognize them as being the normal coping responses, we might be administering a treatment that would be inappropriate uh, for it. The primary problems, again, are the uh, consequence of the neurological uh, injury. So we've got the motor control problems, we've got problems with balance and problems with tone, depending upon the part of the body that's affected. And then the secondary problems are from those bony, uh, from those abnormal skeletal forces uh, developing over time. So muscle contractures, bone and joint deformities, so that could include scoliosis, hip, pro uh, uh, hip dysplasia, uh, torsional problems, and foot deformities. And during ambulation, we have to remember that the muscles and ground reaction forces uh, provide the required force for the motion. The skeleton provides the rigid lever for those forces, and the joints provide the action points at which those uh, movements occur. So this uh, movement that we call gait is really quite complex uh, based on, on all of these things. So let's move on then to what our treatment options are. And ultimately, your goal when you're treating a patient for gait is to try to optimize function. Uh, 
So optimization generally is not possible for the most patients unless surgery is involved at some point. Uh, in our program at Gillette, the physiatrists are heavily involved very early on. Uh, once the diagnosis is made, and sometimes they make the diagnosis uh, from the time of diagnosis up until about age five. If they believe that spasticity is a significant problem, we will evaluate the patient for tone reduction generally uh, around that time. And then if there's orthopedic issues that arise and have developed through the course of growth and development, we typically try to treat those somewhere just prior to puberty. So the prime time for orthopedic surgery would be eight to 11 or 12 years of age. Children are old enough that they probably won't recur with uh, surgery done at those ages and young enough that they can re recover and rehabilitate uh, because they haven't become adult size yet. First, before talking about what we do do, I'm gonna talk about what we've learned not to do because there's been a lot of lessons that learned over time. So there are some things that were done in the past that really shouldn't be done anymore and unfortunately, sometimes they still do happen. Uh, we've seen them. Uh, and uh, so unbalanced surgeries, so stage surgeries, one surgery at a time. Uh, if you lengthen an important power generator inappropriately, that's a, that's a problem. Uh, sometimes, believe it or not, muscles that shouldn't be lengthened are lengthened. Uh, and the tendo Achilles and the soleus is a very good example of that, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Neurectomies sometimes are still done. Most tendon transfers and cerebral palsy probably aren't helpful. Um, Dr. Rang, Dr. Mercer Rang, was a very uh, prominent pediatric orthopedic surgeon uh, in uh, Canada, coined the term birthday syndrome for these stage surgeries. So it wasn't uncommon in the 1970s and 80s and maybe before that even, uh, that a child would start with uh, heel cord lengthening, that tendo Achilles. So um, after that, they'd be in more crouch. Then someone would lengthen their hamstrings so their knees would be straighter, but because they didn't do anything with their psoas, they might be leaning forward, and then finally the psoas surgeries is done, and then they're standing more upright. But all, the, all this while, they've been uh, going through surgeries and rehabilitations uh, with this stage surgery. So one of the ideas with gait analysis is by, able to, by analyzing all of these issues at one time, you can make safe and appropriate decisions, and I'll show you an example of a patient like that. But this is a patient uh, video that I was given by an orthotist when we were doing a conference together uh, quite a long time ago in Toronto. Uh, I don't have a video of this patient uh, from before, but uh, obviously he's dependent on his uh, arms for upper uh, extremity assistance for support. And this patient has undergone all of these stage surgeries that I was just talking about. Heel cord lengthenings, numerous hamstring lengthenings, uh, and ultimately you can see that he's really not able to support his body weight nor propel himself with his lower extremities. So he's doing most of the work with his upper extremities. So this is uh, you know, kind of what happened with, uh, with a lack of tone management and a focus on staged uh, surgeries that were quite aggressive over time. This is being still manifest by uh, the idea of percutaneous tenotomies, which are you know, still actually sometimes maybe even growing in popularity in certain centers across the world. Uh, so with the idea that if a tendon is tight, let's just cut it. Uh, so you know, the attraction of this is that it's kind of a benign surgery because it's marketed and done as a percutaneous procedure. Uh, multiple tiny incisions, you know, short hospital stay, and, uh, and you know, shorter rehabilitation is the idea. But you know, percutaneously releasing the power generators is like you know, losing the spark plug wires on your car. And, uh, and that doesn't, obviously doesn't work very well for your car, and it doesn't work very well for your patients either. So here's the example of a tendo Achilles lengthening. So if you had somebody who had an adequate plantar flexion knee extension couple there, so that's the idea of that um, vector that I've got it, uh, lined up there in front of the knee joint center, that the tibia is properly restrained by the, by the soleus. But if a heel cord is lengthening is done, the soleus can no longer uh, restrain the tibia from falling forward, so the knee falls forward into a more flexed posture. So a tendo Achilles lengthening in isolation, as Dr. Rang pointed out, oftentimes and typically results in crouch gait, and it may be, you know, as an iatrogenic problem, be something that is not recoverable. And this is a patient example here, not of crouch gait, but someone who had a numerous percutaneous inappropriate lengthening of the power generators that included not only the ankle plantar flexors, but also the hamstrings. So you can see in this case, 
you know, when he was younger on the mat there in the uh, physical therapy department, you know, uh, you know, just having some clear balance problems. But now at an older age, after two or three percutaneous heel cord lengthenings and percutaneous hamstring lengthenings, um, he's very weak. Uh, he's uh, having knee hyperextension. He has an anterior pelvic tilt and increased lumbar lordosis uh, as a result of that treatment. It was really hard to treat him to, and no bone surgery prior to that. It was really hard to treat him uh, to, to get him doing better, and fortunately he is now. Um, so what we want to do is try to maintain uh, muscle length and strength as much as possible. So doing that in a conservative fashion with spasticity control and splinting uh, with or without uh, botulinum toxin injections. And remember that if we lengthen a muscle, it does make the muscle weaker, and it should be done as a last resort. And the old idea of doing just tenotomies it really rarely, if ever, is indicated for an ambulatory patient. Jump gait is a gait pattern that uh, is fairly common in juvenile years that if, if it's not managed well, can go on to, um, can go on to uh, crouch gait. So this is an example of uh, a boy uh, in crouch, in jump gait. So you can see the ankle, kin or the knee kinematics uh, showing uh, that the knee is excessively flexed, but there's not a constant knee extension moment, and that's because the ankle plantar flexors are overactive here, uh, helping to support the knee in a more extended position. If that patient is untreated, they can go into adulthood and be in crouch. So uh, this is, was a person who was in a jump gait pattern, uh, had had no surgical treatment up to this point. Uh, he has a very high energy cost. He has patellofemoral pain and uh, patellofemoral arthritis is developing, and it would have been much easier to treat that in childhood. So jump gait is oftentimes thought of to be a precursor of crouch, and if, uh, if it's either not treated or treated inappropriately, it can, can lead to crouch and uh, lead to bigger problems. And particularly, as an example here, uh, this animation on the left is a preoperative uh, depiction of a person who is in a jump gait pattern with a plantar flexion knee extension couple that's in front of the knee joint. But after a heel cord lengthening, uh, the knee falling forward again uh, into a more uh, flexed uh, crouch posture uh, because of the heel cord lengthening and the weakening. And that uh, photograph on the right side is, is a photo of someone who is in, in exactly that situation. So jump gait can become crouch gait without treatment or with, iatrogenically with inappropriate treatment with uh, isolated heel cord lengthening. I've already shown you one example of a person with over-lengthened hamstrings, and it can produce lordosis, uh, stiff knee, and recurvatum. And this is another example of someone who uh, had excessive uh, isolated hamstring lengthening. You lose the pelvic support. There could be permanent loss of hip extensor strength. And, uh, and sometimes, because the rectus femoris is also pathological, you've uncovered the, uh, the problems with the rectus femoris, and that uh, even exacerbates the knee hyperextension even more. One of the problems is, is that for <clears throat> overlengthened muscles and tendons, sometimes there's no real good solution for those problems, and the hamstrings is one example. So um, we don't really have a way to shorten length hamstrings that are overlengthened. Uh, patients may need to use their upper extremity assisted devices, and I sh both of those patient examples that I showed you uh, were good examples of that. Uh, they may have so much lordosis they could develop spondylolysis or low back pain. And um, if you are going to try to do something, you might have to do something with the psoas with intramuscular lengthening, core strengthening, a lumbar brace, and uh, maybe even consider a distal rectus femoris transfer uh, to try to improve uh, knee flexion and take some of the tension off of the knee uh, as extensors. Let's talk a little bit about the history of cerebral palsy treatment, about where we can, because we don't necessarily know where we are today unless we know where we, uh, where we started. So, uh, it was really uh, in the 1940s that uh, we started to have some understanding of normal gait because gait analysis laboratories were getting their start. Um, then, but even at that time, the pathophysiology of cerebral palsy was not very well understood. Surgery was looked at as being a high-risk procedure because of anesthesia potential complications, infection problems, there weren't antibiotics at that point, internal fixation problems were significant. Uh, mixed metals were used and there were problems with inflammatory reactions and uh, uh, chemical reactions associated with that. And we really didn't have good internal fixation options in orthopedics in the until the 1930s with the introduction of Italium. 
As a consequence of all of those factors, surgeons in the first half of the last century were really reticent to operate on children with cerebral palsy for good reason. Um, and uh, for, because of that, treatment was primarily with bracing and physical therapy. Uh, bone surgery was avoided. Prolonged surgeries certainly raised the risk of infection, and multiple procedures were felt to be unsafe and unpredictable. So the standard treatment for cerebral palsy really was to treat with bracing and physical therapy. Surgery was done as a last resort, uh, but not as a first resort. And if surgery was necessary, it was done in a fast and simple way. So that was where the, the genesis of the minimally invasive tenotomies as opposed to uh, uh, more controlled lengthenings. Um, and there was no bone surgery at that point. Uh, they were done in isolation, so again, you got into this situation where there was the, the stage surgeries and the birthday syndrome. So that's the genesis of uh, all of that. And, and of course, as a result, you ended up with these unpredictable uh, outcomes, as I've tried to illustrate. So the situation, fortunately, today has changed. Surgery is a lot safer. Anesthesia is a lot safer and more reliable. Infections uh, risk can be managed with uh, good antibiotic management. Internal fixation is highly developed and very stable. Um, we have a much better understanding of normal and pathological gait, uh, but unfortunately there's not enough education. There's plenty of people who don't have enough education about, uh, about this to, to really understand it. Uh, so I guess that's the purpose of this, uh, this talk to here today is to try to help with some of that education. Um, but ex excellent results can be achieved if you, if you understand the problem. Uh, but unfortunately, again, in some centers, old traditions do continue. Uh, so tenotomies continue to be done. If it feels tight, looks tight, it's going to uh, might be lengthened. Uh, bone deformities might be ignored, uh, but these are the important levers. Uh, still, single event surgeries, you know, just doing one tendon at a time uh, does occur. And uh, with each pr um, uh, time period of immobilization and rehabilitation, patients can become weaker. Um, and still with poor and, and uh, inconsistent outcomes. My predecessor, Dr. Jim Gage, after whom the Gate Lab here at Gillette is named, uh, the James R. Gage Center for Gate and Motion Analysis, uh, said that this is the girl who got him into gate analysis, and this is in the 1970s. So this girl was, uh, was the Connecticut United Cerebral Palsy poster child that year. Uh, and that's what she looked like uh, for some of those photos. So you can see with the crutches and a, cr a flexed crouch posture. Uh, and she had the standard treatments of the time, you know, in the late 70s and in, uh, sorry, it would have been uh, in the 1960s, that photo. And then by the time Dr. Gage saw her in the late 1970s, uh, she was a young adult and uh, she'd had numerous surgeries, all these stage surgeries. And uh, at this point, she was unable to walk. She couldn't bend her knees, so she had a real hard time getting up out of a chair. And because of that, she was living in a facility. So that's what uh, he saw as the bad outcomes at that time as a result of the treatment that was being administered at that time, and he wanted to do better. And Dr. Gage is really the person who uh, uh, should be attributed with the uh, bringing of gait analysis into the clinical realm and, um, and modernizing our treatment. So the clinical advances that came are that we have a better understanding of spasticity and muscle function so that we can eliminate tenotomies completely. And if we need to do some tendon lengthening, we can do that in a more physiological controlled fashion with a lot less muscle surgery. Spasticity reduction is a better option uh, in cases like that. Instead of, the single, instead of the birthday syndrome that's been replaced with the single event multi-level surgery, so again, analyzing all of these problems simultaneously, creating um, a, um, a single package of surgery uh, to be administered all at one time. And I'll show you two examples of that later. Um, there are surgeries that are new that came out of gait analysis. The rectus femoris transfer did not exist before clinical gait analysis. It came around in the late 1980s. This came because of uh, collaboration between Dr. Jackie Perry and uh, Jim Gage uh, talking about a patient that had a stiff knee gait and they noticed that there was abnormal rectus femoris activity during swing, uh, which was inappropriately timed. So they developed uh, the rectus femoris transfer surgery. Uh, and then there started to be a, a much greater understanding of the influence of bone and joint malalignment uh, on gait pathology and how corrections can lead to improved results, so lever arm dis, uh, dysfunction treatment. Uh, we're doing a better job with quantifying our outcome measures so that as we do these treatments, we can uh, know how well they're working and, uh, and know whether we should be administering those same treatments the next time around. And again, uh, gait analysis helps us with uh, communication and education.
Because of those changes, we do have an entirely new approach that's available to us. So less tendon surgery, as I mentioned, uh, better therapy, more attention to skeletal deformity, so correcting those lever arms in a single setting rather than uh, uh, recurring settings uh, through the course of a uh, child's uh, lifetime. And uh, hopefully with that, we have better, more, better and more reliable and durable outcomes. And we're doing a better job of classification, as I mentioned, with the GMFCS as an example, and there are others as well. And again, this, uh, the treatment of cerebral palsy has moved out of the realm of orthopedics and has really become multidisciplinary. And uh, that is uh, the way it is done at uh, most of the better centers. So now I'm going to use uh, three cases, the three cases that I started the very beginning of the presentation with to illustrate what we can do and if we do it well, how uh, safe and effective uh, that treatment can be. So the first uh, case example is going to be a selective dorsal rhizotomy. So we do use gait analysis and the multidisciplinary team to decide who's a good candidate. These uh, criteria were uh, uh, developed um, and we still follow uh, these criteria. The problem with numerous criteria is that not very many of your patients meet all of these criteria perfectly well. Some patients meet it better than others. So as we see our patients and put them on a spectrum for candidacy for uh, SDR, you can imagine that some of your patients are very poor candidates and should be ruled out right away. And other patients are excellent candidates, and I'll show you an example here next. Um, and then there are other patients who may be okay candidates um, uh, or you know, somewhere along that spectrum and trying to decide about them is a little bit harder. These are the criteria that were developed by Warwick Peacock uh, when he repopularized uh, uh, selective dorsal rhizotomy in the late 1970s and into the 1980s and then bringing it from South Africa to the United States. So we haven't seen a reason as over the years to change from these criteria. Uh, so as we see these patients in the gait lab, we look for spasticity. This is the Ashworth test. Uh, we see a patient like this. It was the very first video I showed you uh, today. Uh, so very high on the toes, very stiff knee gait. Um, and uh, so we see that in combination with spasticity. We see these gait abnormalities, so the dumbbell bump, pelvic pattern, uh, the poor hip extension and terminal stance uh, felt to be probably problems with the hip flexors or the psoas. At the knee, there's excessive uh, flexion of the knee at initial contact, poor swing phase knee flexion, and decreased modulation overall in swing. So this is probably a combination of hamstring and rectus femoris problems. And then ex uh, early plantar flexion, particularly on the right side, uh, as seen here in this graph. So that would be a sign of uh, either spasticity, as you see the, the rating of four on Ashworth scale uh, on that right side, uh, or contraction. And, uh, and a very high energy consumption, I should add. When we do the rhizotomy, this is, uh, this, these are the steps that are taken in the operating room. So electrodes are placed in the, placed in the multiple muscles. Uh, the neurosurgeon does the procedure doing a laminectomy, so the exposure of the posterior part of the spine and the lumbar spine, and then opens the dura so that the cauda equina can be visualized. And then each of these nerves are uh, divided into nerve rootlets and then selective stimulation is done. Uh, so this is a, a, an example of the electrical stimulation that's being done. And while that electrical stimulation is being done, a physiatrist is feeling for the response in the lower extremities, and a neurophysiologist is monitoring the electrical activation within the muscles to see which uh, nerve rootlets are firing in a more normal fashion and which ones are abnormal. And then the abnormal ones are selected for, for division, and that's the, that's the rhizotomy operation. We know that with the methodology that we use that things work pretty well. So some of these things that I pointed out uh, before about the poor hip extension improves. Uh, the double bump pelvic pattern improves. The knee modulation and swing, huge changes. Improvements of modulation of the knee and stance, further improvements, and improvements in equinus both during stance and swing. So these are outcomes that we see regularly on our patients. So coming back to this boy, uh, I mentioned him before. Uh, we've looked at his data already. Uh, so I'll just buzz through this here. And we're going to see how he did with a rhizotomy and a one-sided gastric nemius recession. That's the only surgery he's had. He's needed no bone surgery. And uh, again, the only tendon surgery was a gastric nemius recession on that right side that was so significantly tight and in equinus. Um, and, uh, 
He's, he's one of the unusual GMFCS1 patients that's severe enough to warrant doing a rhizotomy. Uh, most of our rhizotomy patients are GMFCS2 and 3, uh, but he's had a really good outcome uh, and uh, continues to do well. Here's an example of a long-term follow-up greater than 20 years after rhizotomy and bilateral femoral derotational osteotomies. This is a patient of Dr. Gage's from the 1990s, uh, and uh, we had a long-term follow-up study of our rhizotomy patients, and she came back as part of our uh, research protocol. And you can see how well she's doing. Uh, continuing to ambulate uh, you know, well in adulthood with a markedly improved gait pattern, foot progression angles, uh, swing phase motion, uh, and obviously a plantar grade foot as opposed to the toe, uh, toe walking that she had uh, when she was younger. And again, no tendon surgery, no muscle surgery. It was rhizotomy and bilateral femoral derotational osteotomies. So a real reflection of the new approach based on gait analysis. And this is another final uh, rhizotomy example. Uh, that uh, It's also an example of how well our um, uh, videos have improved over the years. So uh, when he was nine, he was one of the earliest patients in the gait lab after it opened in 1987. I think his, his was in 1989. Uh, he had a rhizotomy shortly after that. And then uh, 14 years later, when he was 23 years old, he was no longer requiring the upper extremity assisted devices and was uh, ambulating independently, uh, finishing college, and, uh, and he's continued to do well. So rhizotomies uh, hold up over the long term as well. He did require some orthopedic surgery by myself in the 1990s uh, with femur derotation, tibia derotation, and one-sided foot procedure, uh, but uh, minimal to no uh, tendon surgery. So let's move beyond the spasticity management and talk about uh, hemiplegia. So this is a single event multi-level surgery uh, for this boy who when he first presented uh, was nine years old. Uh, we called him a type four hemiplegic, you'll see why in a moment, but a very high functioning GMFCS1. So he was one of triplets, uh, born premature, uh, was uh, in the NICU uh, for an extended period of time, we had delayed onset of walking, so pretty classic uh, history and symptoms uh, for cerebral palsy. Had Botox injection one time uh, to the left gastric nemius, uh, had, had no previous surgery, but his walking pattern had worsened over the past year and uh, the family was concerned about his asymmetry and he was trying to keep up with his, uh, uh, his siblings, uh, his two brothers. Uh, they were all very active with uh, baseball and he was having uh, increasing problems uh, keeping up with them. Um, the, he had the full gamut of gait analysis including that detailed physical examination and you can see the asymmetries between the two sides, the fixed equinus on this side and external tibial torsion on the opposite side. Uh, really tight hamstrings, uh, no knee contracture uh, and significant uh, antiversion on his affected left side as well as a hip flexion contracture uh, on the left. His gait kinematics show the type four pattern. So the type four pattern is involvement not only at the ankle, so here his left side is his involved side. He's in equinus, in stance, and he's got a foot drop and swing. He has involvement to the rectus femoris because of the blunting of the knee curve in swing and involvement to the hamstrings because of this pattern where you see the knee not extending very well and the pelvis going more posterior so you know his hamstrings are really tight. And uh, he has a hip flexor problem because he has a blunting of his hip uh, uh, curve here and this single bump pelvic pattern. So a very classic type four hemiplegic pa uh, patient. In the transverse plane, some significant malrotational problems. So he's got uh, excessive internal hip rotation on his affected side. Uh, this classic pattern with uh, externally rotated pelvis on, on his affected side. And, uh, and even though his pelvis is markedly internally rotated on his unaffected right side, his foot progression angle is normal. And that's something you should watch for because sometimes uh, uh, high functioning patients with hemiplegia can develop an external tibial torsion on their unaffected side and that's what he had. Um, and I think I actually went through all of these things in the sagittal plane and the uh, um, transverse plane already and some asymmetries in the, in the coronal plane. His, um, his joint kinetics were also abnormal, so he had an abnormal uh, early ankle plantar flexion moment, but this is where it's uh, unique between the two sides because on his right side, this was a compensatory vaulting mechanism, and on his left side, it was due to contracture. 
so we can use gait analysis to help us understand that uh, and uh, make the proper decisions of not doing any surgery on his right side, but uh, isolating it to, the, to his involved left side. Fortunately for him, he had good swing phase activity of his tibialis anterior, even though he had a very severe drop foot. So we predicted for him that he might very well uh, not have a foot drop after uh, appropriate uh, gastrosoleus lengthening. And uh, it's very important in patients like this to look for hip dysplasia because it's one of the few case exam or few situations where a very high functioning patient with cerebral palsy can have hip dysplasia, but he did not. Uh, even though he had pelvic obliquity and left hip adductor problems. So he was fortunate uh, he didn't develop hip dysplasia, uh, but his scanogram did show that he had a leg length discrepancy that was also significant. His problem list was this. We thought he had left femoral antiversion, right external tibial torsion, and then multiple muscular tendinous contractures, including the hip flexors, the hip adductors, hamstrings, rectus femoris, and gastrosoleus. So his treatment was quite extensive. It was almost all on the left side. The only thing that was done on the right side was to a derotation of his uh, right tibia to correct the external tibial torsion. But otherwise, you can see that he had a, a femur derotation, adductor lengthening, rectus femoris transfer, uh, treatment for his hamstrings with uh, medial hamstring lengthening, uh, strayer gastrocnemius recession with a soleus fascial striping. Uh, we used uh, Botox to help stretch him because when we left the operating room that day, he did not have full ankle dorsiflexion. Uh, and we uh, used, uh, relied on the Botox and casting afterwards to gain that range of motion for us. And that was a conservative approach. And it paid off. Uh, here's his pre and post uh, video. You can see the marked improvements in his gait pattern. Uh, no longer on his toe on the uh, left side. Uh, his uh, knee motion on the left side is markedly improved uh, and that uh, uh, flex knee position and the anterior pelvic tilt uh, significantly improved. Um, as an orthopedist, I like to look at x-rays, so you get to look at x-rays here too. So this is what his uh, femur osteotomy and tibia osteotomy looks like. And his uh, physical examination, I'm going to just jump over this because uh, it just showed the improvements that you might uh, hope for and expect. But these are the kinematics on his left side. So remember he had this very severe uh, single bump pelvic pattern, this anterior pelvic tilt that was progressive that's markedly improved. His hip extension and terminal stance is improved. So these things would be related to his psoas lengthening. His swing phase knee modulation has improved uh, rather dr dramatically, so he was a good candidate for rectus femoris transfer. He had that treatment, he had a good result. Uh, his hamstring lengthening helped to alleviate uh, this problem with uh, positioning of his knee and flexion at initial contact, and as well uh, helped to eliminate this single bump pelvic pattern uh, as a result of his hamstrings. And then his gastrosoleus lengthening led to this markedly improved uh, uh, ankle modulation. In the transverse plane, we see that the uh, uh, femur derotation helped with his abnormal internal uh, hip rotation and his foot progression angle uh, similarly improved. And he's one of the, f not all hemiplegic patients improve their pelvic rotation, but he did actually. His adductor lengthening led to improvements in his uh, uh, hip in the coronal plane as well. Um, and his kinematics, or his kinetics improved nicely. This abnormal uh, uh, double bump ankle pattern uh, essentially normalized. Uh, even with that treatment, he maintained and still had a good uh, push-off power uh, in uh, terminal stance. And his energy improved as well, so uh, normalized uh, with that treatment. And he came back uh, three, four years after his uh, intervention, uh, continued to do well. Um, I just got his graduation announcement uh, from college uh, uh, engineering program uh, just this uh, uh, past couple of weeks. So um, he's, uh, he's been doing super, super well, super, super happy for him. And the final case is this severe crouch case that we started uh, with as well. So this boy who had been going downhill, uh, he's diplegic, uh, now functioning at GMFCS3, used to be two. Uh, was born quite premature, low birth weight, delayed walking. Uh, and then had some Botox injections when he was younger, gastrox and hamstrings, a little bit of serial casting, uh, and then did have surgery at age seven with gastrocnemius and soleus recessions, but that was isolated. So this may have contributed to some of that worsening of Crouch uh, now that he's uh, another seven years older. At nine years of age, he started to go into Crouch. His knee pain started at that time. 
uh, his um, knee pain was present both for short and long distances and he was diagnosed with patellar stress fractures and these are his lateral knee radiographs so you can see his uh, stress fractures there on both sides. His energy expenditure extremely high. Uh, he, uh, his FAQ level is level six, so it means getting around for uh, household distances but not able to do community distances. And uh, his POTSI scores had gone down uh, compared to what he had enjoyed in the previous, uh, uh, prior to that. And uh, this GDI number is a low number, that 38 is uh, a very uh, abnormal number, an overall measure of gait quality. Physical examination showed uh, knee flexion contractures bilaterally, very tight hamstrings on both sides. He had an extensor lag, patella alta. And his gait kinematics shows uh, severe crouch and stiff knees, excessive ankle dorsiflexion and bilateral external foot progression angles. And his functional model showed a left internal tibial torsion. His hamstrings measured short on his gait graphs. His treatment was bilateral distal femoral extension osteotomies with tibial tubercle advancements, rectus femoris transfers, foot deformity correction for foot deformity that I didn't mention before, uh, the tibia derotation on the one side only, and bilateral psoas lengthening at the pelvic brim. And you can see his pre and post-op videos showing the significant change. So for the distal femoral extension osteotomy, we remove an anterior wedge of the distal femur. By closing that, we get full knee extension. So when we leave the operating room, the knee is fully extended. So that's the idea behind the distal femoral extension osteotomy. This treatment did not exist when I finished my training and really came around in the 1990s, uh, significantly influenced by gait analysis. Um, the other procedure is the patellar tendon advancement, another one that's new uh, since I started my practice. So in this case, it's skeletally mature. The tibial tubercle is removed with the patellar tendon attached. There's a place created for it to move, be moved distally. Uh, the tibial tubercle uh, uh, donor site uh, bone is moved proximally. And then the uh, attention band is placed in the patella and in the tibia to pull the patella down. And then the tibial tubercle is placed back in its new site in a more uh, advanced distal position and fixed there with a screw. Uh, so those are the animations to help you understand what those uh, procedures are. And here's this preoperative radiograph on the left with the patella alta, the stress fracture. These x-rays are taken supine and maximum extension, so that would reveal the degree of knee flexion contracture that he had. And after the surgery, you can see his knee is fully extended. You can see the uh, tibial tubercle screw and the patella down in a much more normal position, and those patellar stress fractures ultimately ended up uh, healing. His energy expenditure went down uh, pretty dramatically. His POTSI scores for transfers in basic mobility and sports and physical function improved pre to post, and his gait quality improved uh, pretty dramatically. Uh, and his gait graphs uh, here, you know, just showing the significant improvements in all of those uh, parameters in the sagittal plane and in regards to uh, foot progression angle. And you'll notice that he had no hamstring lengthening surgery. So his hamstrings measured short preoperatively. After surgery, they measure much better dynamically during gait. And this is a result of the distal femoral extension osteotomy and patellar advancement it has a significant beneficial effect on hamstring function even without doing any hamstring lengthening surgery. So with that, I've shown you three cases to kind of illustrate how critical gait analysis is to helping us make these complex decisions because we know that cerebral palsy gait is very difficult to understand, the pathophysiology, uh, the primary problems, secondary problems, the compensations and uh, deciphering all of those things. Making all these individual decisions about is it spasticity, is it bone and joint deformity, is it muscular tendinous contracture, and who's a good candidate for the surgery? Are you going to benefit from it based on your gross motor function level, your dynamic motor control, your muscle strength? And then uh, with all of that information, hopefully you can make safe, reliable, effective decisions that are not only effective in the short term, but also infected for the, uh, effective for the long term for, for our patients. Thank you very much for putting up with me for the last hour, uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you've got.